What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another edition of the Sunday League Screamers podcast. I'm your host of today's show, Steve McCutcheon, or my two co-hosts, Vito Anazelli and Michael Nowen. We have another great show for you today, but before that, please take a moment, hit the bell and subscribe to us on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, and wherever else you find your podcast. Also follow us real quick on Twitter at the SL Screamers underscore pod. Let's get started. News and notes from around the world. League One Pitch Storing, Volume 3. We apologize for not covering this last week. There was a lot going on, but now for the third time in, what, two months, there's been fan issues in League One. This time again with Marseille and uh, Angers, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> oh, man. Oh, oui, oui. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, this is a broken record at this point. I know we talked about it before, but I, I mean, this is the second time Marseille's fan base has been involved in this. They got I, points deducted last time, I believe. I, I mean, it's going to happen again. It, it has to be progressive penalties at this point. Real fast, I'm just going to say now, maybe we change focus from being a Premier League podcast to just a League uh podcast and just watch them brawl, watch them brawl it out i, I think this, ufc maybe, has the rights to that <laughs> they might they might too. dana white might buy the league league one at this point ESPN yeah. plus <laughs> um in all honesty uh we yeah, we've talked about it in depth before maybe it's best to just let them beat the shit out of each other and hopefully they just kind of hurt themselves so much at this point that they stop fighting each other who knows maybe that's the solution maybe it's not i don't know but is league one the new Concacaf? Oh, Ooh! Wow, Ooh. that is a that is a tough question. Well, they're behind they're behind <laughs> Portugal now in terms of uh, FIFA ranking. So, good point. Not a top five league anymore. They they're coming down the ranks. Yep. Mm. We're gonna have someone's a got a TC Stewart some Cap in League One. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you... In all seriousness, there's there's a photo of one guy, one of the stewards, and um. This, the only thing this guy could stop is Big Mac at this point. I mean, <laughs> this guy is not catching any of these informed fans running past him, okay? I, I, I don't think he'd be able to stop them, and that's no disrespect to him. It's just they don't have enough people, I think is what complete disrespect to. to him, but Stand, yeah, go on. See, there's, there's thousands of people in the stands, and you're, you're going to put, like, 100 people in front of them. Like, hey, you guys mind taking on 10 at once? Like, yeah, what you, you know that guy's happen? getting minimum wage, too. Just stay yeah, exactly. There. He's not getting like, his ass kicked, and who can blame <laughs> It's like, so, it's like the movie 300. <laughs> yeah, yeah. At a certain point, it's got to be on the league to be like, look, if you're not, if you're going to do, keep doing this shit, we're going to do what they do in Italy. We're going to put fences along the lines. So you can't get through. If that's what have, they have to do, that's what they have to do. do all like, the states in Italy actually have to have that. Is that like a thing? I don't or? know if they have to, but a lot South of them Amer- have in South America. They all do. For yeah, the most South part, so. Same thing in uh, South America. I hope it's yeah. bulletproof too down there. Yeah. <laughs> God damn but, Anyway, that's that's that. Just thought it was funny. Funny note. No, nah, absolutely. Let's get over to uh, Stars and Stripes recap. Yeah, so we're going to move relatively quickly through this just because it, this is going to be a pretty U.S.-heavy podcast in general, given the fact that it's the international break. Uh, but just some quick standout performances throughout the weekend, not to get in too much depth. Uh, Joe Scali, Gianluca Buzio, both getting their first goals for their clubs. Um, Scali, in particular, had a phenomenal game. He was uh, in the Who scored... I believe team of the week for uh, the German league this past week, uh, Matt Miazga, great performance against Atletico Babao lost one nil, but he was also in the team of the week and the, who scored uh, pretty interesting. And we'll get into this in a little bit, why they're both not necessarily on the U S roster, but that's something we'll discuss in a little bit more detail. Um, besides that, Brendan Aronson, feel like we say his name on this pod every single week, another assist for him. He's playing lights out for Salzburg. Tim Wea assisted the death for Lille. He's hitting form at a great time as he comes into U.S. men's camp. And DK had a nice little header for a 97th minute winner. So solid performance from those groups of guys up front. Yeah, looking forward to talking about uh, everything U.S. at the end of this, especially with the qualifiers coming up. But before that, let's get to our weekly recap of the Premier League games. <laughs> First up on Saturday morning, we had Everton and Man U. They had a 1-1 draw. Honestly, Great game. Everything came in with a perfect perfect game plan to neutralize uh, Manu as best as they could. Towson, Gray, and DeCorey have been playing their asses off right now. Oh, yeah. Everton. Mm-hmm. Like completely. Oh, yeah. That's why they're so high up on the table, even without Calvin Louis up top right now. Um, is Richardson still hurt for them? Honestly, I'm not 100%. I think he is. I think he might be. I know Dominic Calvert-Lewin is still also. But, um, I mean, 
that those three in particular. I mean, you debatably, I mean, I forget who we were saying prior had a like one of the better transfer windows. I think we were saying Villa in general. This they have to obviously be rivaling them for that in particular. For how much they spent compared to Villa. Oh, oh my the, god. Oh my and what Lord. they're and the output they're getting out of them. Oh my god. Unbelievable. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, they did enough crazy. to piss off Ronaldo, who stormed down the tunnel at the end of that match. I mean, <laughs> granted, that's classic Ronaldo at times, but you stifled him like quite easily, if we're being honest. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I wanted yeah, and to they be were, known. Lucky. I was going to say, well, VAR, VAR hates dancing. Nobody, they disallowed Nieri Mina's goal at the end just because he was dancing. That's so upsetting. <laughs> <laughs> I just about to bring that one up. I appreciate you taking it for me. Oh, God, sorry. <laughs> no, no, you're good, you're good. I was just going to say, listen, like, I think Manu was actually lucky to uh, walk away with the point evens that Yerry Mina, yeah. if, if any striker or midfielder is probably making that same exact run, he stays on side with, like, oh, just yeah. a little more knowledge of, of, of kind of attacking like that, and uh, mm-hmm. they probably get the win. So, unfortunate for uh, everything, but also a great performance away. So, yeah. next up, we had uh, Chelsea and Southampton. Yeah, Chelsea went 3-1 in this game, but the scoreline was a little bit far from the actual pace of play for that match. Uh, good first half for Chelsea. Saw Chalabas score off a flicked header by Ruben Loftus Cheek, who's now back from injury and seems to be trusted by by Tuchel going forward, which is good for them given the injuries that that team is seeing right now. Uh, they did have two goals allowed for offsides. One was definitely offsides, and I'm sorry, the other one was a foul in a build up play about 30 seconds prior, uh, as Plaquetta had had committed a foul. Uh, and of course, Timo Werner finish. Um, so that is, <laughs> end up counting. Um, Southampton, though, credit to them. They came out and they took it right to Chelsea in the second half. And for large portions of that second half, they were definitely the better team. Uh, Livermento, who used to play for Chelsea and sold Chelsea sold him in the in the offseason, um, was fouled by Chilwell, who got his first start of the season for the Premier League. Yeah. And uh, Ward-Prowse converted the penalty, 1-1. Um, unfortunately for Southampton, they ended up picking up a red card and a pretty, pretty – Vicious tackle on Jorginho, but personally, my opinion could have went either way. I was going to say, um, do you think it was a red or do you think? I don't. Was... I don't think it's a red. Personally, I, I don't think so. I, I think it was. I think he tried to play the ball. He just made mm. the wrong tackle. I understand how he was sent off for that red card. I think it's 50 50 up to the referee's discretion. But at the end of the day, if you're doing something to endanger a player, you're off. Mm. Yeah, um, I think it's just where the studs landed. If they were like on the foot or something like that, but they were higher up on the, like, the ankle, calf, shin area, uh, and yeah. it just made it look a little worse. Mm. Yeah, and and once he got sent off, the, sh- the power shift went immediately back to Chelsea, and it was kind of a story of the unlikely hero- heroes for Chelsea this this week. Um, a goal from a defender, a flick on by a player who hasn't really seen the pitch for Chelsea and, and lost his cheek, and then Ross Barkley, who had been introduced, pings one out to defender as Piliqueta, and then Werner scores. And then it finally gets sealed up with a Chilwell volley after, you know, two players hit the post. So it was, it was a lot of positives for Chelsea, but you can definitely tell they seemed a little bit exposed. And it, it wasn't for that red card. I'm not entirely sure Chelsea walk away with all three points there. Southampton have a knack of really playing up to their level of competition. And that's something that yep. it's, I think it's got to be taken note of as the season moves on and moves forward. It'll be interesting with their depth, how they're able to, mm-hmm what they're able to do, kind of where they're sitting in the lead, but yeah. a credit to them in all honesty. I mean, they've too. already pulled points off city and United this season. Yeah. They're going to be, I mean, yeah, they're going to be fighting no doubt like for relegation that they're hundred percent going to be down there towards that way. But if they can steal, like you said, more points off those top tier teams that uh, the other bottom tier can't do, as long as they take care of business on their end with like when they're playing the Watfords or the Burnleys and Newcastles, yeah. they, they might be the team that stays up. Yep. Yeah. Next up we had, uh, Wolves and Newcastle. Yeah, actually a pretty good game for Wolves in particular, not necessarily Newcastle, but Wolves get the win 2-1 for the most part throughout that entire game. They pretty much imposed themselves on Newcastle from the relatively beginning. Um, and like we were saying last year, right, Jimenez got the goal. We talked about potentially that's going to be the spark for him, the spark for that Wolves team. And you could tell like once that game started, they were playing with an air of confidence, right, when they were coming. Jimenez had two assists. Chan had two goals. Don't look now. That might be the Premier League, maybe new strike partnership. Who knows? We'll find out. Uh, I'm not going to read the comment that Steve wrote, but <laughs> <laughs> but it Keep could moving. be a it could be a Kane Son partnership in the making. Who knows? But um, it's awesome to see. Obviously, him and I was doing well. Uh, Chan Chan uh, coming in, getting his goals too. So it's good to see. Yep. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, next up, we had Burnley and Norwich. Nil nil draw. Very exciting match. Um, props to Norwich, though. They did end their 16-game, I guess, defeated streak. Um, they <laughs> lost 16 straight. 
they finally put their first point on the board. So every, every team now is on the board for, uh, for the Premier League table. It guys, they were one win away. And I mean, a, a bunch of goal differential too at the same time, but they're one win away from being at four points and tied for like 17th, 18th in that range. So as much as we kind of shit on them early in the year, I was looking at the table and I was like, well, they're still very much in this relegation battle. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's still early. Still very early. Three points from safety. Yeah, but not not honestly, really not much in that game. The other team created a whole bunch. So no, no is the right result and props to them for the first point of the year. Next up, we have another storyline too. We got Leeds versus Watford. Yeah, Leeds record a win. Uh, it's their first one of the season, which brings the total count of teams without a win down from five to now four. Uh, so good for Leeds. They definitely deserved all three points here. We're, we're definitely the, the more dominant team on the front foot, looking to create more chances. Watford really didn't have much to to offer or throw at them for the most part. Lee's got their goal early and it always seemed likely that they were going to get another one, but unfortunately they just couldn't find that. So that that's a little worrying for that team, but given, you know, the run of results we've seen from the beginning of this season, it, it was an all important three points against what's going to be potentially um, a relegation candidate uh, in news though, for Wofford, if you want to bet on them, now's a pretty good time since they just appointed Claudio Ranieri as their oh, yeah. new head manager <laughs> So if the uh, odds aren't 5,000 to one, uh, they, they will be going down soon. Um, but that's the big news for them. That's a good, good, good appointment for them. I mean, Claudio Ranieri, he's, he did well, done fairly well everywhere he's gone for the most part. So he has, he has a knack and a history of pulling teams out of the death, the jaws of death, right at the last yeah, minute yeah. with Leicester. And then winning so. a Premier League title with yeah. them. <laughs> so, Hey, who, who the hell knows? Right. Yeah. Um, but I think you're missing the biggest piece too, Vito in that game. Leeds got a clean sheet. That doesn't happen often. Sheet, yeah. I was trying, <laughs> so I was not, I wasn't going to say, but it, I was going more for the win, but yeah, they got the clean sheet. Do you think, uh, in my opinion, Grant, we, we, the clean sheet thing is a pretty, pretty funny joke and everything. They felt more like the leads of last year. And then Watford looked more of what we expected coming into the season. Yes, I, I definitely think that's true. And I, I'm, I'm hesitant to say that Wat, uh, Watford, that leads defense looked good. I think it was more of a case of, the best defense is a good offense. I mean, they had two thirds of the ball. They created mm. 20, 20 shots or so, something along those lines, and held West um, Watford to I think like four and maybe one on target. Mm. So from that Wasn't perspective, much. I don't know how how long that will will last. But yes, I do think they that that was more resembling the team we saw last year than any other game they played this season. Cool, cool. Then we had Brighton and Arsenal. Yeah, we had the perennial shithouser, Neil Malpe, versus the young guns of Arsenal. Uh, the matchup everyone was actually really looking forward to because, um, you know, Arsenal in the ascendancy off the North London Derby win, Brighton just in phenomenal form, uh, especially after after this week. But there, honestly, you could say watching the game, Brighton were pretty unlucky not to nick a win here at the Amex, and they mm -hmm. really did dominate on possession. They dominated, as always, on XG. Um, and it kind of made Arsenal, to their credit, go into a little bit of the shell prior to their North London Derby win. Um, Brighton looked really good. Arsenal, you know, kind of brought that to earth a little bit. There's no need, reason to really panic for, for both teams. But, you know, you have to say for both for both in general, from where they started the season, where they thought they'd be to come into this international break, Brighton sitting at, what, fifth or six? I'm sorry, six, right? Arsenal at 11th now when they were at the yes. bottom of the table early in the season. Um Gets a good result for both teams, 0-0. Zero, zero. I will also say, Graham Potter, if it wasn't already known, dude's the real deal as a coach. Um, he's he's a phenomenal tactician, so. Yeah. Agreed, agreed. I like, uh, yeah, Brighton, dude, they're, they're a great storyline for this year, and then we'll get to everything, I guess, in a little bit, too, but it's awesome seeing the, like, where they are on the table right now. Uh, next up, Tottenham and Ashton Villa. Tottenham, two. Ashton Villa, one. Uh, Hung Ming Sun had an absolute – belter of a game just took over it i know i know uh holberg got the uh, man of the match and everything but i thought sun looked excellent he had the assist taken away because i think the one uh goal the second one ended up yeah. being a goal anyway so yeah kind of hurt him in that aspect and stuff but great performance by them good bounce back win thought villa could have gotten a little more from the game um maybe nick the uh nick the Nicol i can't sure i can speak apparently nick the equalizer <laughs> uh made it two two but Credit to uh, credit to uh, Tottenham in this one. Yeah, the leaky defense got a little bit more plugged with Romero in the yeah. back line. So he looks like Teal. He'll be the real deal, hopefully. And Son, like you said, he was lights out. He was the by far the difference maker in that game. So, 
Yeah, much, much, much needed win for Spurs right there. Mm. Definitely. And Next then, up, we had uh, West Ham and Brentford. Yes, Brentford. Yeah, um, <laughs> if you ever want to watch a good game, just go watch a Brentford game at this point. I mean, after a 3-3 draw, a thrilling 3-3 draw, one of the games of the season so far, if not the game of the season so far, um, they followed it up with a 2-1 win this week against West Ham with a 94th-minute winner. Sai Benrahma was very good for West Ham, threatened a couple times with shots from distance, just Nick near the post and, you know, forced Fabianski, not Fabianski, sorry, forced him in a couple good saves. Um, but ultimately, thinking Brentford were going to hold on, actually, for the majority of that game, West Ham was able to sneak one back with about 10 minutes to go or so until the ball fell kindly in the box. Um, and Jan Wiesa, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, put it home for a 2-1 win, and Brentford just keep flying. They, I think they deserved all three points here. Um, while they weren't the better team for large stretches of that game, when they were in their good moments and their good passages of play, I thought they were much more fluid and, and, and cohesive as a team than I thought West Ham were that game, even mm-hmm. if they did suffer without the ball at time to time. So good to see for them and they're finished strong for the international break seating and now seventh place with right one, right behind Brighton, two points. Yeah. That's, that's a story right there. Yeah. Hopefully they're able to keep that up. Cause that'd be amazing. Yeah. I think Tony was a little unlucky too. He had a couple opportunities that I think should have went in. Yeah, agreed. And for anyone that's listening and looking to uh, get a Premier League team or follow one for the first time, I'd say I'd just say go for Brentford right now. Brentford. Like have some fun with it. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yep. Then we had a uh, draw, two two, Palace and Leicester City. Oh yeah, what is going on with Leicester City? Uh, it just feel like this season is a lot of uh, the teams that performed well last year are not living up to it. Um, West Ham's dropping points, Leicester's dropping points, Wolves aren't looking great, et cetera. But then you have teams, Brighton and Brentford, who are doing extremely well. And Palace is looking really good now, too. Um, Leicester went up 2-0 pretty early on, but the Eagles came literally soaring back uh, with two late goals in the 61st minute and the 72nd minute. Nice punt. Again, Vardy found himself on the short score sheet. <laughs> Kelechi and Nacho was on the score sheet, so good to see him back as well. Um but it just seems like another issue of Leicester's defense. We said it early on, on in the year, they'd have to figure out how to plug up that black back line. That was probably the primary reason for them not making it to those Champions League spots when, they're, when they've collapsed over the last two seasons. Mm-hmm. And now, after seven games in the Premier League, Leicester have conceded two or more goals in four of those seven matches. Um, that, I mean, if that trend continues and it doesn't seem like it's going to slow down anytime soon, they, they can't hope for many better results other than a mid, mid-table finish at this point. So they really doing... need to pick it up back there and figure out what's going on. Um, or Brendan Rodgers is going to see his Barcelona job potentially disappear. <laughs> They're doing their best Tottenham impression, but they can't hit the three nil losses just yet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the multiple games. Yeah. <laughs> Props to a uh, palace though, man. They, they really picked it up. I think Vera's got oh, yeah. them moving and grooving right now and good for them. They're fighting out some hard fought, like really oh, yeah. tough results. Every, every game it feels like. They have yeah. they definitely had the building blocks in place, like, you know, giving him the reins was like a brand new young team lets him impose his system on these younger players. Right. They all probably look up to him because he's obviously he's Patrick Vieira. Right. Um, they got some good stuff cooking. It might maybe it's not this year and maybe they finish like in that 12th or 10th. Maybe if they're lucky, that 10th spot. But the following year, like you have to say, like they could be a force if they're able to he's able to get them playing well. So. Yeah, they've, yeah, they looked really good. They're unlucky not to get that win against Brighton, who did a fantastic job last week of clawing back a draw at the last second. I mean, yeah. a couple of things go slightly different for them, and you're you're look, you're talking about a 12th place team or an 11th place team at this point. Yeah, I, it's weird. I feel like they're going to be the type of team this year. They're going to have a lot of hard learning experiences where they're either going to draw games they shouldn't be drawing, or yeah. they're going to lose, like yeah. you just said, against Brighton, like late on or something like that. But then the following year, when they stay up, they're going to look pretty damn good, and they're going to figure out ways to capitalize on three points, exactly like what Brighton's what doing Brighton, right now. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. They are a very unpredictable team when they're playing. They're not necessarily in their play style, but what type of team you're going to get that day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And then Vera too, being a first time manager, like he's just, he's going to pick it up too and figure out how to use it, utilize his guys and, and go forward too. Yeah. So then the uh, last game of the weekend, probably the most exciting, I would think Liverpool and city. Oh yeah. Lots of build up, lots of drama. It was an unbelievable game. I had obviously big title implications for later down the line for not just these two teams, but the other two in the top four. Um, yeah. I mean, where to even begin? Mo Salah, Sadio Mane both had pretty phenomenal games for Liverpool 
Um, and then credit to Pep Guardiola and his team, even though they're strikerless right now, they came back after being down both times to find the back of the net and really push themselves forward. In particular, we obviously have to call it out. Most a lot, he legitimately probably, he, debatably, he could have had the goal this season for Liverpool just then and there. I mean, he put Bernardo Silva on his ass. Like, yeah. I, it was a disgusting ball roll that sent him just flying, and Laporte couldn't keep up with him. Finish was excellent. Uh, it's awesome to hear the the cop. Is it the cop? The or that's what it's called, right? Yeah, the cop. Yep, cop. It was awesome to hear it that loud. Um, it was like rocking in there. Um, hopefully, that's what the environment's like every time they play, because you know it's it's a hard place to play. And so credit to City for even getting a point out of that, especially after that goal, because at that point you thought it was done and dusted. Yeah. So. And you know what? Credit to uh, shout out to Roger, Roger as well, who made an unbelievable <laughs> clearance on yeah. Fabinho when he when it looked like. Yeah, uh, all he had to do was lay down the ball, would have rolled in by itself. You know what I mean? Yeah. So he he definitely he saved points for there for uh, City in that match. That might be guys, huge later in the season. Do that you guys have be. any reservations with Liverpool with these draws that they're kind of obtaining? I feel like later on in the season, some of these games, like especially like a Brentford three three, they 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 had enough quality they should have won that game. Um, same thing with the City game, left it late. What do you? I, I'm getting vibes where like that's the type of stuff that doesn't like they're not going to win the title because of that. I don't have any reservations off of that. Um, Brentford is giving everyone a game right now. And this is of course city and they were winning at yeah. times, but my, my reservation with Liverpool and the title conversation is what it, what it was last year before, before it happened um, is just their depth. While they have an unbelievable starting lineup, they really like if most we saw it last year, most Salah went out or Sadio Mane went out or Virgil van Dijk went out and they have no one to fill that back line or not the back line, but just those positions where their star players are. Look at any other team that's challenge that's challenging for the top of a league table, league table across the world. The Chelsea's, the Manchester City's, the Real Madrid's. I'm not going to put Barcelona in that conversation. PSG. PSG. Yeah. yeah <laughs> Bayern Munich. You know what I mean? Like when you lose somebody of, of impo- like massive importance, there's at least someone who may not, it was obviously not going to do the job as well, but it's going to have the ability to come in and kind of clot the bleeding a little bit. And I don't think this Liverpool side has that because you've already seen uh, Roberto Firmino lose his spot to Diego Jota for the most part. He's been coming off the bench more and more. And when he's in the lineup, he's not really getting the goals that, you know, he was getting a couple of seasons ago. So I, I think they're just missing that, that little extra push, maybe, maybe even a little competition in the lineup just in general. Mm. Okay, interesting. Yeah, so I was just curious on your guys' take because I feel like they should be picking up some of these three points more and more, but they're not. So um, we are coming up on an international break, though. So real quick, just kind of going through the table, some thoughts and comments on it. Our top four, whatever order you want to give it in, we had all four teams there. Chelsea, Liverpool, Man City, United in that order right now. The big surprise is the next three teams in that table. Mm-hmm. None of us had any three of them, I think, anywhere close to where they're at right now. Everton in fifth with 14 points. Uh Brighton sixth, 14 points as well, just behind on goal differential. And then Brentford seventh with tw- with uh, 12 points. Yeah. I mean, like we were saying, Brighton, I mean, those three teams in particular are being coached tremendously well. Uh, so to, to those coaches, phenomenal job. Um, I really hope they can keep it up because I, it's an awesome story for them in particular to kind of see that like just progression for a couple of those teams, uh, especially after Everton, after like a couple of the years they've had with Carlo and then Marco Silva, Brighton, you know, they had all those terrible missed chances last year. Now they're really producing and then Brentford, obviously just coming in and running amok and giving everyone a, a serious fight. Um, yeah. It's it's really quite the story. So, so far. And um, yeah. I, I think, I know I'm a Chelsea supporter. I'm like, I know you're a Tottenham supporter, but in all seriousness, I'm a little worried about Tottenham still. I know we're just worried about oh, yeah. in general, but oh, yeah. my, main, my main concern right now is they're the only team in the top half of the table that has a negative goal differential. And it's, it's a negative four already. They've, they've shipped in six. Um, they shipped in 10 and they've only scored six. Now I think they're in a good, they're an okay place right now in 12th place. The teams in front of them, Brentford, Brighton, and Everton, I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not, I don't want to jinx it, but there's a chance yeah. that they start dropping points here and there, especially when it comes to a more congested schedule, but they need to turn it around and Harry Kane needs to get on his horse because he's not firing. And if that happens, those three wins, those one Oh wins three times in a row, oh, yeah. that's not going to continue happening. And we saw that over the last course of the last four games. So I, they need to turn it on as soon as the international for, break. For, because for them in particular, Vito, yeah. their next three games in the league, Newcastle, West Ham, 
who's kind of skidding a little bit, but they usually yep. play them pretty hard. And then Burnley. Have to win. Or, or, or not, or not, not Burnley, I'm sorry. It's Newcastle, West Ham, uh, Man U. Sorry. Okay. So they're playing Manchester points. United. And then they play Everton. So there's a chance for them to really come in and, you know, steal at least a couple points in, in that schedule. Mm-hmm. The Man U game, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens on how they're kind of playing. But, you know, they have an opportunity and Nuno has an opportunity to really kind of put some of the fears that people have about him as Spurs supporters to bed. Mm-hmm. If he's not able to get, I don't want to say maximum points, but let's just I say see. 70 to 75% of those points, I think you're looking at a situation where they are not, they're willing to part ways before Christmas yeah. at the end of the day. I, so. I think I, I get that. I think my only other call out to that table then would be, I know it's seven games in and I know you're looking at teams like Norwich city and Steve, this is exactly what you said before at Newcastle and Burnley that don't have wins yet, but you can only relegate three teams. And there are six teams with one win or fewer right now. This is the relegation battle is entirely open. I don't care that Norwich has one point or that Burnley has three or that crystal palace has seven. Uh, you're talking about essentially two games, and I think it's it's way too soon to be calling any of these teams down at this point. I'd agree. I'd agree. Yeah, I mean, with Norwich, though, obviously it's just been the way they've played. That's a little different. Most yeah. part, so, like, <laughs> I understand, like, when people, like, come up, and we've said it on the podcast before, too, just kind of, like, where they're at and what we're – like, the eye test and just looking at yeah. them and how, and how they're functioning. But, yeah, no, you, you can't count anyone now. They can okay. go on a run of three or four games on the bounce. It'll win. Yeah, redacting that. They're the only team you're allowed to count down an hour already. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I feel bad though. So if you take the winless teams, you got Southampton, Burnley, Newcastle, Norwich. It's Burnley. Out of, those, man. out of those, out of those four right there, do you think who would you be say most likely out of those? Current, current form, I would take Southampton right now. Where, where they're at to, to go on above. On past form, can't count out Sean Dyche and Burnley. So. There, you know, they're magically somehow figuring it out with the last four games to go. Mm. Yeah, barring an injury to Ismaili Sar, who's playing out of his skull right now, Wofford seemed likely to avoid a drop. He's, yes, if he goes down, I, I, then it I don't see how they, they continue. Up I mean, there. We can speculate all day, but I'm just saying it's, it's too soon to make any assumptions on these teams going down because the bottom half of the table is just as close as early on. Definitely, definitely right. Let's, um, you know, it's enough Premier League for right now. Let's head over to the United States men's national team's World Cup qualifiers that are coming up. Yes. Um, kind of just Oof. a quick recap of what went down last time. A lot of unhappy fans out there. We had five points. We had a draw at El Salvador to open it up. A draw at home to Canada after we were already up one nothing, And then a win at Honduras. It was 4-1. We went, went down one nothing before halftime. And then played our best 45 minutes of soccer the entire time throughout qualifiers right there. So with 16 people, uh, players make their World Cup qualifier debuts. So a lot of youth and experience thrown in there. So I guess looking back on it was five points, really that bad of a result, maybe not so much, but I think we all want to at least see seven or more. So Mm. let's um, let's talk about the roster a little bit though. What, um, what'd you guys think about it? Any kind of snubs, any surprises that people were there, all that kind of stuff. Honestly, I, I don't know how you leave. I understand maybe it's a system thing or something along those lines, but Conrad's been a, a dangerous player. I, I don't see how you leave him off, especially with Pulisic not there for the time being, or Reyna not there just from like a depth mm-hmm. perspective. That one kind of stumped me a little bit. So I definitely would say that one. And I, I know a lot of people would say Scally also, but I think the reason that they just didn't bring him in is exactly what you said, Steve, where – Greg probably saw that inexperience in those CONCACAF games. And he was like, Hey, I need to bring someone in who has a little bit more, maybe mental fortitude to kind of work through those different um, progressions. Right. Uh, Not to say Scally can't do it, but you know, I don't say I wouldn't love to see him, but I think he just wants someone to win now who has that experience, which is why, at least in my opinion, he didn't come in. So. Yeah. I was, I was a little surprised initially to see GSC's artists on there as well. Um, expect, especially to Mike's point, leaving out someone like Conrad De La Fuente. But um, I, I'm calling out Zardes because I think Baralta recognizes the need for maybe a little bit more experience in this team. If you look at the five players, the five forwards selected for this between Brendan Aronson, Ariola, Hape, Pepe, Tim Weah, 
all of those guys combined have like 60% of the caps in comparison to Jesse Zardes, who has 62. I think they have 37 between them. And that's four mm-hmm. people or five people. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I actually like the fact that Zardes is, is, is in this team right now. And he is playing uh, fairly He's well. Playing well. He's in form right now. As two. Yeah, so I think it's a deserved call up. And it's also something that team's going to need because it's no secret that Pulisic is – the driving force behind this this team, maybe both in emotion and raw ability. So if you're not going to have that on the field, you need someone with leadership experience. So I, I'm happy to see Zardes uh, on this roster. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. Um, I, I'm with Mike. I definitely would have liked to have seen Conrad. I think he's Great. the most like-for-like like switch um, between yeah. Pulisic and Weya, or not Weya, um, uh, Reyna out on the wings Reyna. and stuff. So Scally. I th- like like Mike said. I I think Verhalter just went with guys one he that are a little bit more experienced, and then two he's more comfortable with personally. He's coached before and he knows what they're capable of. Yeah. I think he realizes this window if he puts up a bad showing that there could be legitimate talks mm-hmm. for you now. And I think he's just trying to maximize as many points as possible. Plus being down Pulisic, plus being down Reyna, yeah, doesn't help his chances one bit. So yeah, I, um, I, sorry, go ahead. No, you're, I was just going to say Brooks is out too. So now you're talking about another key guy down, but Richards is in this, in this camp as well, which I think all of us are pretty excited to see him and a potential miles Robinson back too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's Definitely. something I'm excited about. What, uh, what other players are you guys looking for, uh, forward to seeing? I'm always looking forward to seeing Brendan Anderson play. I, I hope you oh, yeah. keep it up. Oh yeah. Five goals and 10 matches for the, for the national team already. And he's playing out of his school at Salzburg. So I mean, you're talking about a guy who has another good showing. The, the transfer rumors are just going to continue to heat up. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, Weston McKenney's back in the lineup. Thoughts on um, that after the suspension? I'm for it. I am too. I'm all for it because, you know, like Greg said, you know, there's the door is never shut. McKenney has also been getting a lot of shtick from uh, Max Allegri at Juventus, kind of saying that he's not been working as hard, or at least kind of in that team, and he's been a little slow on the ball, something along those mm-hmm. lines. So I think you have a player – who's going to either respond in two different ways, someone who's going to come in and maybe shit the bed. Hopefully it's not that case or two, someone who comes in and realizes the moment and with the, with the situation he's in and he responds Weston McKinney from all intents and purposes. I obviously don't know him, but from what we can tell, he seems like that type of person to do the latter and he will have a response. So I'm really looking forward to see how he steps up and plays in that team. Got some goosebumps from that one there, Mike. I like it. (laughs) What about you, Vito? Anyone else? No, I, I'm I'm actually with Mike on this one. I, I'm actually that's not true too. Tyler Adams, of course. I mean, Kellen Acosta, legit. I, I'm really curious to see how, how this team is going to cope without Giorena and Pulisic in these important games. Because Steve, to your point, Baralta realizes that he needs to pick up these games. Right, we're playing Panama, Costa Rica, who are the two teams directly closest behind us, and then last place Jamaica. We win these games, that can set the tempo for the for the rest of qualifying. Like that could be, yeah. it, you know. Yeah. Um, and so it's I'm happy I would to almost see. go ahead. Sorry, I, I'm being impolite. I almost cut you off. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> no, you did. I, I, you, you, I, you did cut him off. But <laughs> I, I was gonna say for Panama in particular, I feel like that game's a must win. Yeah, because they're second in the group right now, if I'm not mistaken, right? They're tied with us in Canada for so, five points. You, you five lose points. that game, you and have Canada ends up winning next game. You're talking about the, the gap starting to open and open and open. Yeah. I mean, it's important that all three of these games are played with the the highest level of intensity that you know players mm-hmm. like McKenny will bring. So I'm, I'm mm-hmm. happy to see him there. I'm happy to see the, that slate wipe clean. Cause I mean, in addition, that also sends a message to the other guys as well. Like if you, if you screw up, you're not playing, but you could have a second chance, but you have to earn it. Mm-hmm. And this is his chance to earn it because it, people will argue. I'm not saying I'm one of them. People will argue that Weston McKenney was the reason we didn't get a not maximum amount of points, but as many mm-hmm. points as we could have gotten during mm-hmm. the last round of qualifiers without him and, training with him in the system and then all of a sudden he's not there and you have to make replacements on the last day beforehand so his his response is going to be what i'm looking forward to most yeah i mean i heard the depth that we had in our midfield as well um mm-hmm. one person my probably the two things i'm most looking forward to seeing uh miles robinson like i said before in the richard's mm-hmm. back line i really hope we get to see those two together um i think that's gonna be a great one to see just because they're both both are very yeah. young and basically the, the future, they, they could be the next eight to 10 years of our, of our, our, t- our center back. Easy. So, Easy. and then the other guy was um, Eunice Musa over at Valencia exactly. been playing pretty well right now. He was out last camp with an injury. He was just coming back and he, I don't think he was fully fit. And that's why he didn't get called in. Um, but he might be playing that Reina role in that number eight, if we can possibly move him into that, you know, that midfield and stuff. So I'll yeah, be excited like- to kind of see how that goes. 
he's electric on the ball. Like he can really, oh. you know, he can really progress the ball forward. Yeah. So, I mean, that he's what that, I feel like that team was almost lacking in like those qualifying games is having that ability in that player to really bring it up from the midfield. Yep. Uh, and that, so. that's why I'm kind of disappointed. We, we don't see Conrad right either. Cause I think that's exactly someone who we could use. Mm-hmm. You know who else too, actually, I really, I'm really hoping gets um, some game time is Chris Richards. I thought he's had a good start to life at Hoffenheim. And he played extremely well in the win against Wolfberg, who were undefeated at the time. And uh, Armenian Beal, I don't know how to pronounce that name, but another fantastic game. He posted like a 7.6 rating. So I think he's having a, a pretty good start to life over there at Hoffenheim. So I'm hoping it translates into this and he gets his opportunity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, the upcoming opponents, I know Vito kind of mentioned them a little bit. Uh, we got Jamaica, Panama, and then Costa Rica. Jamaica and Costa Rica both at home should be – Listen, I, I really, and then Pan, Panama's away. I really think nine points is not out of the question, even though we are a little bit weaker of a squad right now. And I think, if we said it last time, last window, seven was like the number. Do we I know? Think that's a minimum. Do we know? And I don't know if we, I forgot if we pulled up the Jamaica roster. Mikel Antonio, is he playing? Leon Bailey, is he playing? I could pull that up real quick, actually, and give me a second. But um, yeah, no, that's a major thing for them. And don't forget, too. Um, they also played at Panama and they weren't allowed to have some of those guys in the roster because of the UK issue. So we might be, we're probably going to be down Anthony Robinson and uh, Zach Steffen as well. Well, for the moment, Steffen's been selected. No, no, no. I'm just saying for that game. So what's going to happen oh, is they're oh, going okay, to okay. have to stay in the U S um, gotcha. for that. So they're going to, they'll be available for the Jamaican game at home. They go away to Pan. The squad goes away to Panama, but because they're UK and they won't be allowed to return to red flag country, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, um, they have to stay, train just with themselves, and then when the team comes back at home to play Costa Rica, they're allowed back in the squad again. Yeah, well, no, no disrespect to Zach Stefan. I, I do, enjoy, I like him a lot as a keeper, but uh, he's not getting games anywhere else. So if he has to stay and play this game, he needs to stay and play this game. Agreed. Be agreed. good for him and for the team. It's looking like it doesn't look like Antonio's playing, but it looks like Leon Bailey is on that squad right now, at least from what I just saw. But I could be wrong. If that's yeah. the case, that's a that's a huge obviously blow for Jamaica. But yeah, definitely. I mean, and Bailey's in incredible form right now in the Premier League too. So he's making that switch. He's looked he's looked absolutely electric. Didn't he actually just pick up a knock? I could be wrong on that. I don't know. Might have. I thought he digs. I didn't but, think he played in their last game or he picked up something. I, I could be wrong. But, but anyway, so Steve, do you think we could we should be able to get all nine points here? I mean, how do you not? Like, Jamaica's bottom of the group right now. You have to put in a good showing. Costa Rica is old as hell, like, and not mm-hmm. anywhere near where they were in that 2014, like, magical run. And then Panama was – they be, barely beat us out last World Cup qualifying, and they put up a relatively poor showing during the World Cup. We obviously have multitudes of just – much better talent than them away or not down a couple guys or not. I, there's just no reason we shouldn't, we shouldn't be pulling max points. I don't think I, I'd say the two home games, hundred percent. You gotta, you gotta win those. Um, the one against Panama in Panama, I wouldn't be upset with a draw. I wouldn't obviously be the happiest with it, but I would accept it. But if that's the case, those other two games, they have to be won because you like Vito was saying, that gap's going to only get bigger, especially if you drop points against Panama. So, so my, my thing with that is too, though, like when does the, like when do U S fans and like the U S in general stop with the, it's an away game in CONCACAF. Like it's a tough game, like kind of the kind of mentality. Do you like if Spain walked in to Panama, are they not winning five, nothing regardless? Yeah. But you're also making the assumption that the USA is Spain. <laughs> I'm not. Yeah, I'm, 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 and we're not Spain. <laughs> <laughs> we're definitely not, but do the fans at least not make it feel like we should be like them or playing like them? And in turn, are, are, are the expectations just too high then? I don't think the expectations are too high. I f- think that sometimes people get the idea that we should be in certain places, but from an experience perspective, these players just are not there yet. Not to say they won't be in a certain mm-hmm. amount of time, and I think that we're jumping the gun too quickly. And they should qualify. I'm not saying they shouldn't. But to expect us to come in and just totally dominate just because Serginho Des plays for Barcelona and he played with Messi for a little bit. Or Pulisic plays every once in a while for Chelsea, right? You know, it, it's kind of 
you know, may, or maybe it is a little over, you know, on the. Yeah, I think over. six points is fair. Yeah. Six points leaves us in a pretty good position still. I would say seven. I, I, I don't want to see a loss. Uh, I'll take a draw at the very least. Oh, of course, I, I, don't want, I don't want to, but anything less than six, I think, is terrible. I think you're aiming for seven. I think that's a comfortable position. But if you don't, if you get four points, that's not good. Obviously, everything after six is four because you can't get five points unless you, well, you can draw twice, but I don't think that's going to happen. Um, aim for seven. Anything less than six is a bad showing during that. And you're asking questions of Bar- Baralter again. You aim, you aim for nine, not seven. Oh, well, yeah. You take seven. <laughs> I'm aiming for seven. They're aiming for nine, Mike. <laughs> yeah. I, aim for I 12 switch. in the fall with nine is fine with me. I want to switch this up real quick for a second. I have a question for you guys. Any thoughts on the congestion of this? You're, you're, they're playing three games, home, away, then back to home, then back to wherever their respective clubs are. And they're playing three, three matches in six days, October 7th, October 10th, and then October 13th. Is it just me or does that seem a little too congested for something that you've had time to plan out for years, especially considering they're qualifying qualifiers? Logically, Vito, that makes sense. But we're talking about, about the FIFA go- here. We're talking about FIFA. Yeah, right? We're talking I about say logically. And, those made sense. I was like, really? Cock and calf and FIFA. You know, like they don't yeah. give a shit. Uh, we we've covered this in detail. They they don't care. So they're just a vessel for their money. That's all they're. A little are. ridiculous. If you were I, to put those games in the same same you know span, but two games were home. And then you traveled somewhere that I could understand, but to travel three top five times round trip, basically by the time they get back to their clubs over the course of six days is it's a lot of traveling. I also think that might be why we saw a relatively heavy MLS lineup coming out too. Cause they're already sitting yeah. on, on this side of the hemisphere where you're not dealing with a five hour, six hour, however many hours out coming over yeah. from Europe on yeah. a short, like you already played on a, a Saturday or Sunday. You got to, jet lag all the way back here and you'd be ready in two days for camp, like for p- playing on the third day. Mm-hmm. It's tough. I think Greg also could have used, I th- cause he called them what? 27 players. I think it was. And he's allowed up to 30. Yeah. That, uh, that's, and that's another questionable. Thing. Why, why not yeah. just pull in the extra depth? You know what I mean? You got, you got three games in seven days. You saw last window between suspension to McKenney and then how many injuries we pulled up. I would just have the guys ready already. Like in camp, this Destin way. Have him. Sorry, sorry. Well, no, I'm going to say this way, like in case you do have the injuries, they're in a full camp, right? You're not just pulling like Jackson Ewell for a day. Yeah. And if he comes on the field like, oh, shit, like I don't want that. I mean, Dest has his own injury problems recently. I think also another reason for this this heavier MLS lineup is MLS is getting to the business end of their season. Um, you're talking about guys that are have been played pretty much an entire se- season already in 29, almost 30 games for most of these guys. So you're definitely getting a little bit more more prime instead of some of the tired legs from the early parts of the European season. So I think that could be another contributing factor to uh, the quantity that we're seeing for, from um, the domestic league here. Agreed, agreed. Do you think, um, to your point before, if we come up with less than six points, Greg fired? I think it w- if, if they come up with five points or four points, I think it depends on the quality of the performances. If you're going to get performances based on the first two, like the first two matches we got in the first round of qualifiers. Yes. I think after this, we talked about it last time. I said the same thing. I think you have to give Greg these three games. I think six games, you can make a determination. Then it's, then it's too late. The the rot has set in after these six games. If you, if you let him go any farther, you have to base it on the quality of performances you're seeing, because at the end of the day, he's not with these guys every day. He's a national team manager. He calls them in. They train for, what, four or five days, and they go and play. Ultimately, he's going to get a quick chance to set these guys up, put them in the formation that he needs to be playing in. If he gets the formations wrong, the personnel wrong in those formations, yes. Sorry. That's your, yeah. literally your only job as a national team manager. You don't have the entire offseason to plan with these guys like these club coaches. If he does these things correctly and the players are just like – missing chances in front of them, like Wondolowski and against Belgium. Sorry, I'll never forget that. Um, still hurts, still hurts. Then I don't, I don't think you have, you jump to that, that conclusion as quickly. Um, so I, it's going to, it's going to be dependent on the performances ultimately. Yeah. I'd say anything less than five points. It's very rightfully. So you have that serious discussion and that yeah. serious. Thought. And I don't think you can, you can um, challenge it at that yeah, point. You couldn't. Um, 
we'll see. Um, I mean, who the question is who comes in to replace him? Who's the caretaker? And right now, it most likely, if I had to take a wild guess, it'd probably be like a Tab Ramos or somebody like that. And well, not this. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe. <laughs> That's but it's not to say, and it's not like a disrespect or a, a jab at Tab, but it's you know, we also have to think about who's going to come in and really get the most out of those players in a short amount of time if like they go down that route and. That's something you have to think about. And I'm sure they're thinking about that, have contingency plans, whatever, but something to just, you know, food for thought. Okay. Yeah. I feel you. I feel you. Do you think Greg is the right guy for the job then or no? Short term, long term, you can, you can split it up. Short, short term, term, not long yeah. term. Yeah. Yeah. Short term, yeah. Long term, no. I, I wouldn't like after this cycle, I wouldn't stick with him. I would try to bring somebody else in. But, okay, um, so like after the 2018 World Cup, you think just cut ties unless there's like some outrageous the 20, showing. The 2022 World Cup. Yeah, yeah, I, you yeah. know, I just sometimes you just you know it hurts. You get, you get you older. Want to go back in time I, a little I, bit. I, I know. Um, yeah, I'd say after assuming the U.S. qualify, right? Um, yeah. If they don't qualify, obviously the next day you're gone. But um, uh, if they don't, if they do qualify, let him ride that out, and then afterwards, I think you know, hey, thank you, you did all all you could. It's time to bring in somebody else who, with a little bit more pedigree that we want. Well, you'd have to wait till after the World Cup at that point. Exactly, but that's what I'm saying. Yeah, no, I I agree. I think short term, definitely the right guy. I mean, what else do you want him to do? He can he comes in, he wins two trophies, almost yeah. felt like immediately, right, and kind of got felt like everything was kind of back on track. This is the first major blip we're seeing from him and this team in a, in a little while, I think. And even so, I mean, you still have to look at it and say, okay. I know the, the performances weren't tip top, but you know what what you want to see and what you expect with some of the quality that's in this squad. But you're still talking about two draws and a win. You're only two points behind the leaders in yep. in Mexico, so everything is still there to play for. If this goes bad, then you have that conversation again. But I think you you have to stick it out with him. You got to put your you got to throw everything behind him. Okay, I got you. Next time uh, we're recording, though, we'll have two games in the books, and we'll have a much better understanding of it. So, I'm yes, excited to see what's going to happen. We're going to have other, a totally uh, different tune. <laughs> could be, could be I very, hope not, very different. Let me, let me say that. <laughs> Any other uh, final thoughts, guys? Mm, I would like to see Zach Steffen get a game. Oh yeah, we didn't even talk about the uh, goalkeeper controversy. Yeah. I, I think it's Black definitely Matt now. Turner. I, I don't see how you could even remotely say somebody else at this point, but I think Zach's been out of, out of the lineup long enough and he does have a lot of qualities to offer. So depending on fatigue levels and new England revolution are number one in the domestic league, and they're about to break the record actually for most points in a season. And Steph and Turner has been a good portion of that. So who knows if he, he needs a break at this point, you know, and if yeah. he does, I would love to see Zach Stefan get in there and, and show everyone what he has again, because he's kind of the forgotten, he's a forgotten star man at this point. How long, I wasn't very long ago. We were talking to him about being the next best thing on his team. Oh yeah, absolutely. He was the next Tim Howard. Yeah. Literally. Until Matt I, I came along and was like, so you, I wouldn't be shocked if Stefan actually starts the first game because if he's not allowed to go go away to Panama, that's when you throw yeah. Turner in there and you can, I guess, kind of judge each performance individually and then see who starts the third game after that. Yeah. Yeah. I would say in particular, I'm pretty excited to see uh, Yunus Musa play in, mm. in general. I want to see him, if he should be coming fresh off that injury, put him in the lineup, let him do his thing. I think that kid's a talent. So I'm curious to see how he comes out and plays. So. I can say something nice about all these guys, but I think I'm just going to focus on one as my last wrap-up comment. Um, Ricardo Pepe has deserved to be back in this lineup. He's He did it the only appearance he had, and he's been doing it in the MLS uh, since he's gone back and started playing. And oh, yeah. I think there's a lot of big things to come from this kid. You think he gets the start? First I, game? I, he should. I think, I think so. Day one. I mean, you didn't even include um, Josh Sargent in, this, in the call-up. Or people, no sergeant, or no people, folk, no DK, no pool is sick, no Reina. I mean, you're missing all yeah. these attacking talents. When in doubt, go with the guy in form, and he is in form. Uh, yeah, he definitely is. He was, cat- he was a catalyst of the comeback, so yeah, him and Robinson. Otherwise, it's you're gonna, you're gonna look at a you're gonna see a lot with this team in these three games about their character. 
Oh, agreed. Yeah, because we don't have our like our quote unquote stars. Yeah. Our, our playmakers, and this is like the window to see, like, okay, do we have, for lack of better word, better words, like the sack to do it? Mm-hmm. So, anything are these else? Guys boys? Fight, or are they relying on the stars? Sorry. No, no, I was just gonna say anything else before we wrap up. That's all I got. All right. That'll do it for another episode of the Sunday League Screamers podcast. Like, comment, and subscribe. Hit the bell to our YouTube channel. You can also find us on Spotify, Apple, and wherever else you guys get your podcast. Follow us on Twitter at the SL Screamers underscore pod for daily tweets and updates about the show, World Football, the United States Men's National Team, and the Barclays Premier League. I'm your host, Steve McCutcheon, with Vito and Mike signing off.